right about now, streaming directly into your brain at over 1 million IOPS. It's the Data Center Insiders Podcast with Simon Seagrave, bringing you the latest in IT transformation from the data center to the cloud. Hi and welcome to this latest episode of the Data Center Insiders podcast. I'm your host Simon Seagrave, and today I'm joined by my friend and colleague, Itzik Reich. Have I got that right? Yeah, <laughs> awesome, Simon. Not too bad. I'm getting there. I'm getting there. So um, Itzik is the CTO for the EMC Extreme IO product, and um, Itzik, to, to kick things off, um, can you give a little bit of information about yourself? And uh, from there, we'll go into sort of like a high level overview of what Extreme IO is. Sure. So first of all, thanks for having me here, Simon. I know we've been trying to negotiate this podcast for quite some time now. Definitely, yes. It's, it's been busy, a VM world, EMC world before and then just a typical day-to-day -day job. Um, so yeah, my name is Itzik Reich. I'm the CTO for Extreme IO. I actually joined EMC back in 2007, so it's been almost eight years now. Um, I started my career at EMC as a team lead for VMware Professional Services for EMC and non-EMC customers as well, although we prefer them to be EMC ones. <laughs> and then, like you, I think we both moved together to the vSpecialist role. We did, yeah. That's when we uh, worked together for about a year or so. Yeah. Yes, the good old days. Oh, yes, yes. A while ago now. <laughs> yeah. Still, I think it's uh, almost feel like a family, even today. Oh, it is. It is. That's what, that's why I like catching up with a lot of sort of uh, people that I've worked with, such as yourself, in the past. It's a great opportunity. Yeah, it's amazing to see how we all scattered around the company in key roles. Oh, it's a, it's a funny industry, isn't it? Because uh, you know, even people that have gone away and come back again, it's uh, yes. you know, it's a big industry, but it's a small industry at the same time. <laughs> yes, exactly. And in June 2012, I got a phone call from Extreme IO. Uh, remember, EMC purchased uh, Extreme IO as a startup in May 2012, so a month after the public acquisition, I got a phone call to come and join a PLC uh, for VMware as a customer in Cork, Ireland, and I never say no to uh, Murphy's uh, or Guinness beer, <laughs> so, uh, so I flew over, and honestly, and I'm, of course I'm biased and I'm also a marketing person, but honestly, uh, my mind got blown by the technology back then. Uh, we were still an alpha product, not even a beta one. And, but I was doing PLC for VDI for VMware again as a customer and as a person that worked as a V-specialist before, VDI was kind of my thing at the time. And I got blown by the technology itself. I couldn't believe how fast it was to deploy VMs, how fast it was to boot VMs, how fast it was to configure the volume. So everything that I knew about the traditional storage had to die. And as a cynical person, and as a skeptic person as well, it was really difficult for me to forget those things. So I literally stayed there every day until after midnight, just trying to break the system and see, I mean, looking for the catch, if that makes sense. Yeah, and, yeah. And, and did you find one? Uh, no. <laughs> Uh, luckily for me, the, the canteen was still open back then in Cork in the VMware headquarters, so I was eating a lot of uh, cereals at the time. And, uh, you know, I did have the chance to, to drink Murphy, so that was good. Oh, that was good. That's always a bonus. <laughs> That's always a bonus. And in December 2012, I got a request to join Extreme IO as a corporate SE. Um, I immediately say yes to, by the way. And I started my career there as a corporate SE, basically pre-sale for customers across the world. And also I started my integration with the research and development team basically as a liaison point between the external field to the back office, to the R&D teams inside the Extreme IO offices. And then I got a job request to join to uh, the CTO office as a field CTO, which I did for a year and a half. And today I'm actually the CTO of the group, so I'm running the solution teams, I'm running the technical marketing teams, and I'm still uh, acting as a liaison point between the research and development team to the field. Now the field in that case is uh, SEs, customers, and even other EMC internals. So we're working on a very joint collaboration between Extreme IO to other BUs at EMC. Uh, which is, again, something very beneficial for me because of my knowledge in other EMC products. So because we were V-specialists, we never focused on a single product. So we had to really know everything, if that makes sense. 
Yeah. So, yeah, so for example, I'm working a lot with the VSI plugin team, with AppSync, with the Recover Point team, all of those things that uh, I gathered the knowledge uh, for many, many years working for EMC. That, that's really what I'm trying to bring back to the company now. So De- definitely. That's what I'm, I- well, it's been quite a quite a rapid rise for you, really. Um, you know, up up to your current position at the moment, and uh, you know, the, 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 it's an exciting product, and the, you know, that's why I've been very keen to get you on on, on here to discuss it some more, and uh, you know, to to inform folks out there listening to this, uh, you know, as to what Extreme IO is. So, I mean, based on that, it's a, can you can you give us a, an overview of what Extreme IO is? You know, what what are the technologies? What makes it such a a hot hot product at the moment? Because I know internally, it's it's you know one of the fastest selling products that we at EMC uh, have. So, uh, you know, can you give us an overview as to what it is, maybe some of the, uh, you know, the technical aspects behind it, how, it, you know, what, what are the components? Sure. So, first of all, Extreme IO is an all-flesh array, meaning that we don't have any mechanical drives inside of the array itself. Uh, but there are many other all-flesh arrays as well. So, what is the magic, I think, is really the, the, the question that you're trying to ask. So in the very core architecture itself, we are what we call a category two architecture, which means a scale out architecture, but a tightly coupled architecture. So unlike a scale IO, for example, that I think you interviewed a couple of weeks or maybe months ago, we do not scale to hundreds of nodes, we scale to tens of nodes, but still because of the tight, tightly coupled architecture, the performance is linear. So the best way to think about scale IO is like a Lego building block. You start with one, which has a known capacity and quantity, and in the case of uh, all flesh IO, also performance characteristics. And then if you want to grow your capacity and performance linearly, you just add another Lego building block, or as we call it, an X brick to the cluster. And now you have two Lego pieces inside of the clusters that are really sharing the performance and the capacity between themselves. Now, scale-out is nothing new to our storage, right? The VMAX has been doing scale-out for years, and NetApp has been doing scale-out with their cluster mode. We differ, for example, from a NetApp uh, scale-out mode by the fact that the capacity is automatically spread across all the available uh, bricks in the system, but moreover, the performance. So there is never a place where a volume is owned by a specific controller or a storage processor or an engine or whatever you want to call it, which is really the same, yes. the compute that deals with the storage. And because everything is spread across all the available controllers, there is no bottleneck in the system. I mean, if there is a bottleneck, it's probably on the system level that you reach the maximum uh, performance characteristic of the cluster itself. In now, which case, it's it's it's, at which time you just add another X brick into the to the mode again to scale it out, like you say, linearly. Exactly. So in our case, um, the scale out gives you many benefits. From a performance matrix, we've already discussed those, but from a system administration perspective, which is really my personal favorite feature on the product itself, I didn't start my career as a storage admin. In fact, I'm not a big fan of storage in, uh, in general. I started my career as a virtualization person, right, with vSphere. So to me, the ability to not tweak the system or to not need to think about rate groups and, or pools or caching or anything of that nature. Basically, everything is done internally by the system. You always get better performance than RAID 10, same capacity overhead like RAID 5 and RAID 6 HA capabilities in terms of the drives. Well, that means that now you don't need to do really anything on the system. You just need to carve up a volume, present that volume to the host, and that's it. You are not faced with questions like, what should be the RAID type? And let's face it, even in, in traditional arrays, if you start with your product and you know what volumes RAID they should be carved up based on, how can you be sure that that's going to be the workload of tomorrow, right? I mean, VM removes everything with storage vMotion, so maybe you put an Oracle databases that required RAID 10 to start with, but now storage vMotion will move them to another RAID or to another volume group. So those are uh, really big benefits for me as a system administrator and for our customers that are using Extreme IO. There is nothing that you need to configure. Is and, it, is, sorry to interrupt there. It's like, is there any ability, you know, for the hardcore storage admins maybe listening to this, is the, the, the ability to so, sort of go into an expert mode and really get under the hood with it and sort of tweak and adjust things? Or is it literally a, a something of a sealed unit, you know, once you get up and running, it's got all the smarts, you know, all, all, you know it's, got, it's got the intelligence really to work things out and 
you know, and, and you just set and forget, basically. Yeah, so, so it's a good question. I mean, we have what we call more or less like a simple and advanced configuration. So advanced will give you more questions to answer. So for example, if you carve up a volume, you can also tag the volume. You can also add the volume to a consistency group if you want to snapshot or to replicate the volume. But the basic core administration is exactly the same. There is no advanced functionality where it comes to volume provisioning. And again, it's a very good question, not just for Extreme IO, but for the industry as a whole. We are now at a phase where if your core responsibility in your organization is just to carve up plans, I think you need to evolve to something bigger. Now, some vendors will call you a cloud administrator, some vendors will call you a generalist, meaning that you need to focus around everything. I don't know. I don't know what is the good answer, but I know for sure that if the things that makes you tick in the morning where you go to the office is to, wow, I'm going to carve up some volumes today. You are missing the boat, basically. And again, it's nothing about Extreme IO or even EMC in general. That's what those cloud providers brought us, right? Google, Amazon, Microsoft Azure, and even VMware vCloud there. You don't think about the volume. You don't provision volumes there. You think about the application layer, right? So. Yeah, we have moved the storage industry and it has been moving for quite a while. It took us 25 years, but we're finally there. So. <laughs> no, definitely. And, and you mentioned, so the X, XBrick is the smallest sort of com component or, or, or unit, uh, you know, as it were. I mean, what's the minimum amount of XBricks that you need for an Extreme IO installation and sort of what can that scale up to XBricks wise? Right. So the minimum configuration is what we call a starter XBrick or as I call it, half a brick. Half a brick, yeah. Which is really half in terms of its capacity. It has uh, 13 drives, and in terms of performance, it's exactly like the performance of his older brother. You just have smaller physical capacity. Then you have the 10 terabyte X brick, 10 terabyte row, 7.56 TIB net usable capacity. Of course, because of data reduction technologies that we haven't mentioned yet, and we should, um, so things like dedupe, compression, and thin provision can allow it to scale even up to 130 terabytes. Wow. That depends, of course, on the use case itself. Uh, that model, the 10 terabyte model, can scale up to four X bricks in the cluster. Then we have a larger physical capacity X brick that is a 20 terabyte model that can scale up to eight X bricks in the system. And then we have the monster X brick that we've announced at EMC World and we GA'd in July which can scale out to eight X bricks in the system. Each X brick is 40 terabyte, again, without data reduction. We haven't mentioned them yet. And that can scale up to even a petabyte of data if you do leverage things like the dupe compression, snapshots, and things of that nature. Got so you. those are the and so, that's so, the family. Right. So those people listening to this, so it might have seen the EMC World announcement. That's that's what was uh, uh, endearly called the uh, the beast, wasn't it? The, the announcement yeah. of the beast. So uh, yeah, that's a, that's a heck of a product. And uh, you know, whilst we're talking about this, people always want to ask when you start talking all flash arrays. Do you know what sort of you know what what sort of throughput can you push through one of these sort of IOPS wise? I mean, obviously it depends on your workloads, etc., like that. How much storage you've got. But you know, if we were talking hero numbers, I mean, what's sort of like a ballpark? Thing? on one of these because I'm, I'm guessing it's not slow <laughs> no it's not slow at all and um, in some cases i think we can push even up to a million or two million iops uh, depends on the workload and how the dupe it goes because the more deduplication that you have in the system the less real iops that you really need to serve uh, you are really serving the majority of it from the metadata which reside in our memory that's the reason why we have so much ram inside of each one of the controllers and um, i think the performance question is uh, is a given and a non-given today. Mm -hmm. um, meaning that for the majority of the workloads of yesterday, maybe you don't need so much performance, but here's the problem. And that's, that's a question that I'm actually asking my customers every time that I'm starting a session about Extreme IO. I typically start with that. Um, it's not the latest iPhone, it's only the 6 Plus. Yep. Apple, uh, you can't buy the 6S Plus yet. But the question that I'm asking my audience is, uh, why do you keep upgrading your smartphone device every year or so? And the cynical answer will that to be will be because I want to be a buzzword compliant. <laughs> right. I want to always I want to always have the latest gadget. But the real answer is that the moment that Apple or, or Galaxy with Samsung or any other Android device comes with a new device, 
That's the moment that suddenly your device operation system is not behaving as it should. So iOS becomes a bit sluggish. Maybe you get complaints from your wife or your better half about the fact that WhatsApp is not as fast as it used to be before. And it's true, it's not a conspiracy. It's basically the fact that if you are a cell phone vendor, you want to make sure that the new hardware that you just announced knows to leverage the operation system that you just announced as well. So compare this to, a, let's say, a database. What will happen if you give your DBA so much performance? Do you really think that they're going to tell you, oh, please take away the performance for me? Right? It sounds, it sounds silly to even say it out loud, because it is. <laughs> and of course, the answer is no. The, the answer is that they, the day one, as we call it, they will get very excited by the performance characteristics and by the other features of, of the platform as well. Day two, they will take it for granted. And day three is maybe you can guess. <laughs> yes. Yeah, they'll always take as much you know, performance uh, that, that, that you'll give them. Yeah, yeah. It's a slippery slope at that point. You almost want to yeah. uh, well, eke it out, <laughs> as it were. Yeah, exactly. Day three, they will ask for more, yeah. right? They will tell you, oh, I need more capacity or oh, I need more performance. And actually, it's something that we're starting to see in our customers as well, right? We give them like a, a large x configuration for their databases where maybe they don't need so much performance, but they are already thinking and, and doing ways and doing things with the platform that they didn't think about it when they initially bought it for, if that makes sense. So yeah, yeah th this is where we are today in terms of performance and where the market is actually going. So speaking about that, it's not just about the inner numbers of performance, it's really about everything else. Um, so we, we started to mention data reduction. So deduplication and compression for us is something that we always do in line. There is never a point in time where we throttle dedupe or compression um, because the system cannot cope with the load like many of our other uh, friends in the storage industry are doing. Uh, why are we not doing it? Why don't we throttle down dedupe and compression? The answer is simple. We have enough compute in the cluster to do deduplication and compression in real time. Hence the reason why first we are an active-active array. So even if you start with a single X break, both the controllers are participating in this I.O. breaking. And of course, when you scale out, that, that holds true as well. So everything that we do is done in real time. And that's also allow our customers to do many, many things that they didn't think before. Right, right. That's interesting. So sort of uh, another question for you. I mean, obviously, Extreme I.O., I mean, like I said, exciting products and great technologies there. You know, you're talking flash, inline deduplication, compression, you know, some, some great stuff there. And also, you know, like you say, you can start from one X brick or half an X brick and, and scale up uh, from there. Obviously, we've got other storage offerings as, you know, as uh, within EMC, you know, we're, we're not just a storage company, we've got other offerings as well. But, you know, obviously, we sell other other storage products there. How does Extreme IO fit into the overall portfolio? Um, obviously, we sell sort of, you know, more traditional, um, you know, scale up type uh, storage solutions such as VNX, etc. Um, so how, do, how, how does Extreme IO, um, you know, work, work within our portfolio? So... I think that is actually the answer why Extreme IO agreed to be bought by EMC. So that's another scoop. There were many other companies that fought for the princess. Um, and the answer was the ecosystem integration and the fact that EMC is a very good company when it comes to acquisitions. Right? They really know to integrate the product well into the rest of the portfolio. And Extreme IO is not a one-trick pony. So I can give you an eye overview of where we integrate with EMC. It's actually, as I mentioned before, part of my role. So for example, let's start with the big things. A replication for Extreme IO, we do via RecoverPoint, right? So for those people who are not familiar with RecoverPoint, think about RecoverPoint like a TiVo or whatever device that you're using back then in the, back there in the UK. So you can go back point in, in time to the point where you, you can actually see the recording or the transaction level, if that makes sense. So RecoverPoint can be bought either as a physical or a virtual appliance. And the best way to think about it would be like a scale out for application. You can buy a single recover point or scale out. And if your volumes needs more power in terms of replication itself, you can have multiple RPAs that can tackle that volume performance characteristic where it comes to replication. So the question is, why don't we uh, maybe replicate internally natively with Extreme IO? And the answer comes back again to performance. Your core storage controllers needs to cope with the load of the primary IOPS, and now they also need to cope with the load of replication. 
and you don't buy all flash array to make it slower than a hybrid array. And the reason why scale out replication is the good way of doing replication for the large customers, right? Small customers may actually need the internal replication. They, they, they can today achieve with things like recover point for virtual machines and so on and so forth. But recover point is a good example. Now, it's not the traditional recover point uh, solution. We don't use what we call a splitter. We don't split the IO. What we do is really try to do what we do best, which is snapshots that I'm sure we'll discuss in a second. But we offload those snapshots to recover point which then in return replicate them to a remote array. Now, the remote array can be pretty much any array that recover points support. So think about it for a second. You can have extreme IO at your production site, but you can actually maybe replicate to a VNX at the remote site because maybe you do not need the performance characteristic at your DR site, or you don't have the budget to pay for an all flash array. And, you know, as much as we love to sell your all flash array for your production, the recovery site, if you don't have the business justification to do so, do not buy an old flash array at a remote site. So it's the heterogeneous environment of recover point and our integration to it where it comes to the portfolio of replication at the EMC portfolio. So that's one example where we can actually integrate to another replication solution and actually replicate to another storage array that is not even extreme IO, right? Many, uh, maybe even the majority of the old flash arrays force you to replicate to the same old flash array at the remote site. Well, why should you, You're right? Again, it's a DR site. You do not always need the same performance characteristics. So, so, this, is, so this is ideal for those companies out there, perhaps you know, upgrading their storage. They upgrade to Extreme IO. It means that they don't need to mothball their old storage they've got there. They could move it to their DR site across town, spin it up, and just use that as the DR site. So yeah, no, that's good. That's good. Exactly. In fact, we have many customers that done exactly that. They purchased a VNX maybe a year ago, and you know the storage performing good. Uh, you have many many years of maintenance. You don't want to return back the array. You want to leverage it. You want to keep the TCO right. The storage is an expensive thing to buy. So yeah, yeah. they move the the storage to the DR or to test and dev, and they're replicating between extreme IO using recover point. So that's again a very good value. And um, the other things will be uh, smaller things like maybe the Viper controller, right? So Viper is a self service portal that allow you to provision a snapshot, do many, many things with many EMC and none EMC products. The logic behind the Viper controller is that it is not the data path, it is the controller path, the management path, which means that if you have a large site or maybe a site with many storage products, EMC and non EMC products, you do not want to manage them separately. Maybe you don't have the, the force to do so, or maybe you just couldn't be bothered with learning management interfaces of many, many products. So you can put the Viper controller in and Viper becomes your management portal to the world. In fact, you can even give your users the ability to log into the Viper controller and just provision storage as they want from it. So again, another integration point with the, with EMC. Then we also have the smaller things. So things like the VSI plugin, which I'm very passionate about. I'm sure you are here as well as uh, this uh, specialist guy, right? Definitely, like yourself. I mean, my, my background isn't storage traditionally. I'm a, I'm a virtualization guy from way back. So yeah, the VSI has always been uh, pretty high on my priority list as well. Yes, exactly. So the VSI, for those audience that are not familiar with the product, it's a free plugin for Virtual Center. It stands for Virtual Storage Integrator in our jargon. And again, it can do many, many things. Uh, it allows you to provision storage from within vCenter. It allows you to set best practices. And there are many, many best practices that you want to apply when using an off or specifically Extreme IO. But again, you could, of course, script them or even read our user guide. And those best practices are probably somewhere in page 200. But nobody <laughs> reads user guides anymore, right? Again, because of these devices, they, they yeah. just work. Yeah, yeah, the smartphone, yeah. There you go. So you just use the VSI to apply those best practices. And we even have special integration with the VSI that no other vendors has. So for example, we've mentioned RecoverPoint. And RecoverPoint has what we call an SRA, storage replication adapter, that products like VMware SRM, Site Recovery Manager, can leverage to replicate to their remote site. However, SRM has one big, big disadvantage. Recover point allow you to fail over to any point in time. However, site recovery manager only allow you to fail over to the last point in time. Right. And that's not good, right? Maybe you have a virus infection or virus outbreak at your production site. Maybe you have an inconsistent data, a logical corruption. 
It's not going to do any good to fail over to the remote site with your virus infection. That, that does it. So what you can do with the VSI plugin RecoverPoint and Extreme IO is actually set in vCenter the point in time that you want SRM to think that it's the last point in time, and then it will trick SRM to think that that is the last point in time. And then when you declare a failover in Site Recovery Manager, it will use the point in time that you have selected. That's excellent. And that's, that's to me is a killer feature. It actually shows the integration between EMC, inside EMC, right, different business units inside of EMC, and then externally to the Federation, to VMO as well. That's as tight as integration that you can possibly get between all, all of the parties. So, yeah, those things as well. That's absolutely excellent. So, yeah, it's not literally just Extreme IO on its, on, on its own. I mean, obviously, yeah, a lot of very tight integrations and, and hook-ins to, to, to some other products there. Um, so, so moving on, obviously, you know, the, over the last year, 18 months, um, you know, we've seen a lot of all flash, you know, startups. I mean, gosh, you know, <laughs> there's a ton of them out there. Less so of them now. You know, uh, some are doing well, some not so much. Uh, I mean, what, what differentiates, you know, Extreme IO from, the, you know, a lot of these new all flash array startups that we've seen? Right, so, so there will be, I think, two reasons that I can focus on, which is the technical ones, which of course um, has many sub uh, reasons, and there is the business side. So I'll start with the technical ones because that's, that's at least a topic that I can understand something about. And so, as we mentioned, first of all, we are a scale out architecture. The majority of the old flash arrays vendors out there are scale up architecture, which means that they have dual controller. In the majority of the cases, only one controller is working, the rest is passive, or as we call it in the storage world, Alua. Right? So from a front-end perspective, both controllers will seem active, but internally only one of them is active. And then if you send IOS to the non-preferable owner, internally they will need to do this moving of IOS between themselves. So that's, that's the role that the majority of the startup uh, took. Uh, the reason is why, and the answer is very simple. R&D cycles, to develop a scale-out architecture, and I can tell you this as a first-hand person, it's around 10 times harder than to develop a scale-up architecture. Why? Because with scale-out, you need to worry about every I.O., how to break the I.O.s into multiple controllers, how to achieve HA with all of these available controllers. And scale-up is easy. There is only one CPU, when you think about it, that needs to tackle the performance, and that's about it. A better way to think about it will be from an application perspective, not even a storage perspective. There is a reason why Microsoft SQL and to an extent even traditional Oracle databases can only work on one server. Yes, you can cluster them with technologies like Microsoft clustering, but really the database itself, the primary database, always run on one controller, on one server, and then can, in the case of emergency, it can fail over to the remote site. Now, why did Microsoft do it? Why couldn't they just spread the load across all the available servers for the database itself? Because it's hard to develop a database that can scale out. Hence the reason why today we see so many, well, they're not even startup anymore, but so many database companies that are actually can scale out. So Hadoop, the NoSQL movement, MongoDB, and many, 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 many other database companies. I don't want to insult everybody. I just don't remember the, all, all of them by heart. And again, the question is, wh why? What was the compelling reason for those companies to develop their own databases? And that is the answer. Compute today is cheap, as opposed to the old days. So you want to leverage the compute in a scale-out fashion as much as you possibly can. But again, if you are a startup and you want to produce a product that will come to market in the fastest possible way, that's the reason why so many of them are actually starting with scale-up. So that's, that's the beginning. And then many of, many of the other startups actually adopted the hybrid world logic and just applied them to an all flash array. And many of these reasons, by the way, are not even familiar, things that our customers are familiar with. So for example, metadata, right? In our case, metadata is self from RAM. That's the reason why we have so much physical memory inside of each one of our controllers. And people will ask, well, why do you need the metadata in memory? Why can't it just reside on the drives? And the answer is, as much as SSDs are fast, memory is like 100 times faster, and it will always be like that, right? It sits inside of the controller on the PCI bus, can't go any faster. So metadata fetching from Extreme.io is always done for memory, and the user data itself is being fetched from the drives themselves. So that's another key advantage that we have. 
that from a user perspective gets into uh, the translation of uh, performance, predicted performance, which is something that many, many vendors out there are failing to achieve. And it's something that is very easy to test, by the way. You just need to run a consistent test for hours, and then you will see weird peaks in, in other products. Uh, so that's the metadata in our case, and also snapshots. So snapshot on Extreme IO versus other products is really revolutionary way of uh, cloning your data. In fact, it's that revolutionary that we are thinking of renaming and not calling it snapshot, calling it something else. Right, so try and differentiate it even more. Because I know that's one of the real strong points with Extreme IO is it's, it's snapshotting or well, or whatever you end up calling it, um, uh, yeah. ability. So yeah, I mean, could you give us just a you know, bit more information around that? Sure, so traditionally, let's take it a step back. Um, you had to clone your data, right? In the old days, there was no snapshot mechanism. You had the primary uh, data, and then you want to maybe clone it. Maybe it was a database. You had to clone it to a different spindle or spindles. Uh, that would itself result in a very high footprint in the data center, very slow cloning process because you had to clone the entire data. And of course, uh, a very expensive solution because each clone actually resides on different spindles. Then uh, some companies came with this genius idea of snapshots, basically mean they just create a metadata pointer to the original volume, and you start very small and you grow your snapshot volume as you create more data into it. The trade-off with snapshot was that, yes, you do not consume a lot of capacity to start with, but in 99% of the cases, you actually hurt your production volume performance. So for many customers, that was okay because maybe the production volume wasn't that important for them. But if for a telco company, your production volume they, that are hosting this database is super important, you cannot harm them in any way, shape, or forms when it comes to performance. So they have to, again, shift to clones as well. And that's the reason why cloning exists even today, which is amazing just to think about it. And what we said is that because we dedupe everything in the system and compress everything in the system and metadata is always in memory, for us, and that's a secret, not so secret, snapshot is just like any other volume in the system. It doesn't hurt your production volume performance. It doesn't consume a capacity to start with. And even when you write capacity into the snapshot or snapshots volumes, it's only the unique and the compressed capacity that is actually getting written. So that gives our customers a huge opportunity to really start thinking differently about uh, cloning or, or snapshotting their environments, whether those are just VMFS data stores that they want to maybe take uh, 60 snapshots a day and restore from any point in time that they want to natively on the extreme IO array. But the more important use case is actually databases. For the first time in the storage industry, you can actually take a snapshot of your production database and go crazy with that snapshot and you know mount it to your test and dev environments uh, 50 times. Uh, in fact, the number 50 times is not an uh, accidental number. Uh, so you're from the UK, right? Yep. That so up, up in Scotland, we have a very uh, favorable customer known Bailey Gifford. Uh, Bailey Gifford in, uh, is an investment house located in Scotland. They started with Extreme IO as a better, a better product and a better customer where their production database actually resided on a VNXF. So it was a hybrid array, but... Okay that supported flash only. Yep. And they cloned the database to Extreme IO at the time using Oracle Data Guard. We didn't have recover point integration back then. Heck, we weren't even GA. And they cloned the same database on Extreme IO 25 times. And then one day, their system administrator, uh, Sandy Bryce, gets a phone call from their lead DBA, and he complained <laughs> that their production database is working slower than their test and dev environment. Well, so, that's not good. <laughs> so they moved everything to Extreme IO, replicating with Recover Point to the VNX, but mm -hmm. still the use case for them was snapshot. It wasn't actually the production database performance. Now they're running 50 snapshots of this database, and each developer actually gets a unique point in time of the production database without hurting the production database itself, which is a huge, huge value for our customers. And it's becoming one of the most important use cases for our customers, by the way, from a from a business perspective. Yeah, I mean, I know, you know, from, oh gosh, if we roll back about sort of eight, nine years ago, um, I was working on a large project here in the, in the UK, actually a couple of projects, where we could have really done with that technology because what we had to do at the end of every night is do a, a database export every night. And then we had to import it into, uh, into the uh, test dev environment or the you know um, 
the sandbox environment there and that takes time you know we script it up to a point but there's still a lot of you know room for error there um you know we couldn't do it during the day they were always working on the data from the night before so if for whatever reason that data wasn't relevant or, or you know was corrupt well it wouldn't be corrupt but you know if there were any issues with it we had to wait till the following night to do something so yeah, yeah this this adds a lot of flexibility so yeah i, I imagine the uh, developers out there would love this sort of functionality uh, absolutely. And again, it's not that snapshots as a concept didn't exist before. That's what's something that many of us people get confused about. It's the fact that snapshot that actually works in large scale, that's the first time that it's actually happen happening. Again, very similar. I'm always coming back to the iPhone. Apple didn't invent GPS. Apple, Apple didn't invent uh, the GUI. They just make it work for normal people like you and I. Yep. That are not storage savvy. That's that's the point. We're making storage a transparent piece of the infrastructure as opposed to something that you really need to tweak the knobs in order to make it work. So so we cover scale out that we do versus scale up. We cover data services that we always do in line versus many competitors that throttle them back. They don't stop it, they just throttling it back. So it's like sitting in your car in a traffic jam, you don't go anywhere, but the engine is working. We cover snapshots, and then of course we cover the other integration points into the other EMC portfolio, which is again, a man is not an island, and a storage is not just a box. It needs to integrate with the rest of the piece of the infrastructure itself. And then of course, uh, there is the business value, right? Uh, EMC is the largest storage company in the world, and there's no, no guessing about it. That's the reason why we became the number one all flash arrays in terms of units sold into the market, which is amazing to just think about. We've only GA'd in November 2013, mm. and less than a year, in less than a year, we became the market leader by both IDC and Gartner. Gartner even had to revise their numbers lately, which I'm sure you're familiar with their story yep. about some other startup that didn't really tell the full story, but let's not get there too much. So yeah, so there's again the business value of actually buying uh, the leading storage product from the leading storage company in the world itself. So a bit of marketing I know, but still it's something that customers really care about. To not just to buy a box from a startup that who knows what's going to happen today, the day after tomorrow, yeah. or of that nature. Well, we were, you touched on customers there. I mean, you know, what is if there is such a thing? What does a typical customer sort of run on on? You know, extreme IO. What are the sort of workloads that you're seeing out there in the real world? Is it is it, is it only got a sort of handful of use cases, or is it uh, you know, I'd, I'd imagine it's got quite a broad spectrum of various workloads and use cases um, that people use it for. Yeah, sure. So again, I think I want to take you back to November 2013, and then we can see the market adoption and the trends that we've seen uh, back then up until today. So November 2013, with GA, uh, we only had deduplication in the system, and of course, thing provisioning. So the number one use case for Extreme IO was VDI. Why VDI? Well, we cover the technology aspect of it, which is deduplication, something that the VDI can benefit a lot from without sacrificing the performance. Again, other vendors had deduplication before us, uh, whether it was a sub-process deduplication or even real time, it killed the performance. In our case, deduplication makes the arrays work even faster. So we started with the, uh, VDI. The other reason for VDI was that from a production consider workload, many customers do not consider VDI as a production workload. I think differently about it, but that doesn't matter what I think. Um, but it started with VDI, right? Then in uh, uh, April 2014, we've introduced snapshots into the system. So almost overnight, our number one use case uh, switched itself from VDI to databases. Right. And we are very, yeah, very, very anal about reporting every win. So we know exactly the market trends that we're using and our customers are using us for. So that was databases. Then in September 2014, we've introduced compression into the system and something new happened. So as of Q3 and Q4 2014, we are starting to see more and more customers that are just using us for a generic transactional workload. So if I will actually use Bailey Gifford as an example, they started as a database customer. Today, they're actually using Extreme IO for everything. So they have two data centers and everything VMware moved to Extreme IO across two sites. And something new that was new to me, and I didn't think it's actually going to happen, but I think I know the reason, I'm not sure why, but let me give you my theories that 
those customers that decided to go all flash in in terms of their data center for those workloads that make sense, they also made another switch in their brain, which is, hey, we're already paying you a lot of money to have a flash here and a flash in the disaster site. Why, don't, why shouldn't we just make them both active-active? Mm. So they took the extra step and implemented Vplex as well to make both sites active-active. So they took the concept of an active-passive DR scenario to the next gen, which is an active-active data center. And, and that's exactly what Bailey Gifford uh, were doing. And the thing is, they are not the only customers who, who are actually doing it. I think it has to do with the psychological uh, shift that you're making in your brain. Yeah. And once you let you know, all the walls go down, you're taking it the extra step. And that's really becoming a true active, active data center with extreme IO, Vplex, a vital controller to, to provide self-service and things of that nature. So, right. It kind of makes sense, I guess, really. You know, you've, as, a, as a technical architect or an administrator or IT manager, rather, you know, you've got that. It's easier to sell, isn't it, when you're after budgets that, you know, you've, you haven't got all this hardware just sitting in another data center, just sitting there just in case. The fact that you're sort of sweating your, your hardware at both sites um, whilst, whilst providing a full resiliency, uh, you know, that's, that's, that's a good thing. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and, and I also want to give the other side to it because obviously I'm biased and obviously I will tell you that everything needs to go to Extreme IO, but I won't. So how can you tell if your workload should go to Extreme IO? Maybe it should go to a VNX or a VMAX and other arrays of that nature. So first of all, from a TCO perspective, just dollar per capacity. I'm not even talking about dollar per performance or dollar per flow tile. You can use our free utility called MyTrend Capacity Estimator and it can scan your existing data set, whether it's virtual or physical, and it knows to take into consideration deduplication, compression, and thing provisioning, so it will tell you how much capacity it will take should you decide to move your workload to extreme IO. Right, and where can people uh, get this tool, Ferencic? So it's a tool that an EMC SC needs to run. Uh, the portal is mytland.emc.com. It's a free utility, then the SC, the EMC pre-sale stuff, and install it in the customer site. It's not an installation, it's just a bin file that you need to execute. Mm -hmm. You probably need to wait for a couple of days, depends on how much data set you're scanning. Then you get a nice PowerPoint report, that tells you exactly how much capacity you need to move to Extreme IO, should you decide to move your workload to Extreme IO. What workloads do not or will not benefit from an all flash array? So again, if, let, let's cover them through the use cases. So for example, if it's a VDI, the VDI VM should probably reside on Extreme IO because you need a very low latency and a very good performance and e-duplication is also very important. However, user data should not really reside on an all flash array, any all flash array. I mean, we'd love to sell you, Mr. Customer, an all flash array to put your MP3 files on, but it doesn't really make sense, right? I mean, you don't really associate Word files or MP3 files or Excel files with very low latency. Mm with a lot of capacity. So in that case, we will probably integrate with VNX or Isilon to put the user data on. So there is always a case for hybrid uh, arrays as well in our portfolio as opposed to just sell you everything with one product. Again, we are not a startup company, so we do not have a single product to sell you uh, the customer. Of course, uh, other cases like archiving, Yes, you could archive your database on Extreme IO, but it doesn't make sense. You should probably use another product like Data Domain, or maybe even VNX and Isilon to archive your data, if, uh, because that will require a lot of capacity that you don't really need to retrieve in real time, and you don't really need the performance out of it. Right. Uh, other use cases, uh, we do not support mainframe connectivity. Uh, we do not have a sync-based replication today. So for those workloads, go with the VMAX and SRDF. VMAX support mainframe, VMAX support SRDFS, synchronous replication, so you could achieve those data services with the VMAX as well. So, again, many, many use cases, and really the platform uh, depends on the workload itself. And that's the good thing, again, ab about us as EMC. <laughs> we will not try to sell you the wrong product, right? We have many in our portfolio. Chad, they always refer to it as the power and the kryptonite, right? Many, pro many products in our portfolio, so maybe a complex messaging to our customers. But really, that's the only way to go. I mean, look at other companies that only had one product in the hybrid world. Mm -hmm. What happens to them today, right? So, well, it's a yeah. little bit like the, the example you gave earlier about Apple. I mean, yeah, it's, it's, in some respects, there are sort of similarities to how Apple works. Yeah, you can buy an Apple iPhone. You can buy a, you know, a tablet device, one of their laptops, the desktops. So you can just start with one, or you can 
buy more than one of their you know uh, products and that's where you start getting the real value add because of the tight integration between their various products i mean they're designed to work together if you want that and so you get more productivity you know uh, obviously there's a limit with how many apple products you can buy and i think i probably in my time <laughs> bought, bought most of them but um yeah but uh, yeah similar similar sort of situation and apple's a big company you know it's not going anywhere um in a hurry so uh, yeah, it's, it's funny that you mentioned Apple. Uh, there was a nice caricature that I've seen two days ago. And, you know, Apple just announced their iPad Pro, I believe it's called. And you can actually, yeah. it's a large, large tablet, 12.9 inch. And you can actually buy a pen <laughs> to scribble on it and to write on, on the surface. And Steve Jobs was saying a couple of years ago that if you need to use a pen on your smart device, you fail yes. as a company. Yes. Very famous quote, that. <laughs> didn't they just copy Microsoft with a Surface product? That's exactly what they do. You have a keyboard mm -hmm. that you could have purchased from Apple before. You have a pen that you can scribble on the Microsoft Surface. So again, it's, I think it's the thing with startups, right? They have one product, and if you have one product, then everything else fails. Everything else shouldn't go there. You just have an iPad, and that, that's it. But as, as of course, we, we see today, that is not the case. And even companies like Apple are trying to think differently <laughs> if mm. I try to call themselves. Yeah, you're absolutely right, quoting Apple. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You've got to adapt, haven't you, to the times and the uh, you know the requirements of of your customers. So, so we say a, a question for you. I mean, sort of going forward, are, are you able to give us sort of you know where's where's Extreme I going? Extreme IO going? I mean, can you give us any teasers or, or sort of uh, obviously none too sensitive uh, roadmap information there as to what we can expect in the future? Sure. So. I'll try to be very delicate about it to not go too much into trouble. Without giving like, too much away. <laughs> the NDA police to knock on my door today. Um, so I, I'll start with a small thing. So, uh, for example, in the end of uh, September this month, we will announce the integration with AppSync, which is really the killer application for Extreme IO. Coming back to the Apple iPhone analogy. So we discussed the Extreme IO snapshots. AppSync is a product that's been in the EMC portfolio for quite some time now, and it really allows you to take snapshots of your database and then repurpose the database snapshots on another test and dev server. But for the first time, those two products actually talk between themselves. So you can use the Extreme.io snapshot without actually using the Extreme.io array. So you don't need to open the management GUI of the array itself. And it actually allows you as a DBA to get a self-service portal using AppSync because it thinks about the application owner, mm. and then you can take multiple copies of that database, snapshot them, them to the DR site or to the test and dev site, repurpose those databases, and so on and so forth. So that will come at the end of this month. Um, some other thing that uh, we will also support uh, in, in October, roughly, is that scale out, dynamic scale out. So we've already announced dynamic scale out before, and you can actually go from two to four today, dynamically, without uh, formatting the data. But to scale out dynamically from one Xbox to two, that will also be available very, very soon uh, in October. Yeah. Um, and then, of course, there are other things that will be probably the nature of any platform, which is uh, bigger, better uh, CPUs, controllers, larger drives. Oops, I just gave something away, but that, that's okay. <laughs> um, and of course, other things like integrating into other EMC backup technologies and things of that nature, and some other uh, surprises that uh, will surely come next year as well that I'm unfortunately I'm not allowed to discuss, at least not as of today. Fantastic. So some really exciting stuff coming coming, yep. uh, coming our way with Extreme IO. That's, that's brilliant. So, so we say, anyone listening to this who wants to find out more about Extreme IO, uh, how can they go about doing that? Are there any websites or, uh, and also, you know, let's, let's use this as an opportunity for a plug for your own, because uh, I know you're very active on, on Twitter and social that's media. Right. How can people get hold of you and find out more about Extreme IO? Okay, so the Extreme IO website is extremeio.com. Uh, and also you can find it on the, the emc.com uh, portal itself. Uh, I also maintain my own blog, that's itzikr.wordpress.com, and my Twitter account is also itzikr, I-T-Z-I-K-R. Fantastic. That was brilliant. Well, definitely worth uh, ch check out Itzik's blog there. I mean, I, I learned so much off of that, and uh, yeah, keep up the good work with that. So uh, yeah, I, I love Extreme IO. Very, very, you know, very excited, very buzzed to have it in the EMC portfolio, and uh, no doubt people listening to this, uh, you know, um, if you haven't heard of it before, uh, hopefully it's uh, whetted your appetite, as it were, to so uh, find out more. But uh, it's a, thank you very much indeed for your time. It's been great chatting with you, and uh, I hope to catch up with you soon. Sure. Yeah, let's catch up uh, more frequently.
Thank you very much, Simon. Fantastic. Thanks, Isaac. Thanks. Thanks.